All right. Welcome uh, to this session. It's K-12 Networking, Best Practices for Threat Defense and Secure Posture Development. We have Ed Nettics here, uh, Derek, and then Neil London from Salem Kaiser Public Schools. So, hand it off to you, Derek. Sure. Yeah, first off, uh, yeah, thank you for coming and dealing with the heat. I guess that's what we get for a hot topic like security. <laughs> I got to start with a bad joke. Uh, so, uh, first, uh, introductions and uh, that starts with Mr. Neil over there uh, so uh, yeah I'll, uh, and I'll uh, I'll start with just myself real quick um, I am Derek Jurgens. I, I work for Ednetics and uh, I started in IT with Ednetics actually I'm actually a former educator myself I taught history um, right out of college for a few years and then got interested in the IT field and uh, never looked back. Um, so I started out um, at, on the implementation side of the house. Um, I've helped several of you in this room on uh, network Im implementations and, and uh, you know, I had to further focus on security as years went on, um, including a move to the pre-sale side and the design side of, of the house. Uh, with Ednetics, so helping on a lot of the planning stages of projects. Um, Neil? Yeah, I'm Neil London. I work for Salem Kaiser Public Schools. Uh, in a former life, I worked for Kern High School District in Southern California, uh, largest high school district in Southern California, and uh, moved up here, started working. Uh, I worked as a computer tech down there. Started working as a computer tech up here at Woodburn School District, moved on to network engineer uh, at Woodburn before moving to Salem Kaiser as uh, uh, an engineer, and then from that position, we have a senior engineer at Salem Kaiser. And then in the middle back of the room, we have Fred, also helping us out today. Fred? Hi there, folks. Um, so I won't go through the whole 27 years that I've been <laughs> in the IT industry, um, but the last 12 have been with, with Cisco as a systems engineer supporting the local, state, local, and education market. OK. Thank you. So um, real quick, the agenda today is really uh, to get uh, a lay of the cybersecurity landscape and how it pertains to the educational uh, space that you guys live and breathe every day. Um, so part of that is you know, having a, a reflective look back at the educational landscape then and now. Um, also, we want, we want this to be pretty open-ended, so feel free to stop us at any time, ask questions. Um, We'll ask, you know, what, what kind of threats are you guys seeing on a daily basis and, and things like that. Uh, and then really it's about the journey to building a better security posture and how do you do that? Uh, what resources are out there to you to, to start that if you're kind of on a journey from the beginning, if you're somewhere in the middle, you know, how do you further develop that security posture? What technologies can you use? What policies are already there out for you to use as resources? Um, you know, just have a, have a good sense of what, what tools are out there for you. Um, then reflect it back specifically for the, the journey for Salem-Kaiser Public School and uh, how, how they've gotten to a, a more secure posture. Um, and then lastly, uh, the fun stuff, getting a look at some of the technology that can help you get there um, with a, a demo of Cisco Firepower Threat Defense and uh, specifically looking at some of the, the threat uh, pieces of that software and uh, Neil can can show that you that in a kind of a real live demo and then lastly if we have time uh, you know just open it up for some Q&A and uh, pick the brains of myself and Neil and Fred so um, yeah so a quick his history uh, history lesson excuse me um, so sure sure um, so any of this look familiar to anybody? <laughs> it wasn't all that long ago. Wait, you know, technology was standalone. Uh, you'd roll a TV card in and Bill Nye would turn on for the teacher and that was kind of your technology in a lot of ways. Um, the, the computer labs, things like that were standalone, um, you know, kind of closed off systems. Uh, there, the internet connectivity, if you had, you know, T1 lines, things like that, they were closely monitored. 
Uh, they were limited, you, you know, you, you weren't pushing as much as, as we do today from a data perspective. And then security really boiled down to source, destination, port on firewall, and that was kind of it. Um, that's, that's what security meant for many years, especially in, in those beginning days. Um, so I tried to find some of the stuff that I remember, and I, I know I'm not that old, but uh, that's some of the stuff I remember <laughs> uh, from, from my days. Uh, sitting in computer labs and things like that. Um, now, you know, it's it's all about one-to-one -one initiatives, Chromebooks, uh, iPads, Windows machines, but you know, whatever whatever your flavor is, um, those are obviously a big push. And how do you protect those devices, both within your control on your network and outside of it, because um, they both host their own problems. If if you have devices that that go outside of your boundary, um, what are they bringing back in? Uh, that's, a that's a big deal. Um, IoT, obviously, that's a hot buzzword and for a million reasons. Um, you know, HVAC vendors buying the, the $50 thing off the shelf that, you know, still has the admin admin password. <laughs> um, and, and having some awareness of, of those devices on your network all create new challenges for for your staff and uh, and your network, um, cloud applications also a huge deal. Uh, how do you protect your data that lives perhaps outside your network in the cloud? Um, Office 365, Dropbox, uh, Box, Google, Google Suites. A you know any of those uh, applications uh, have some some implica implications on your own network on how you control that. And then lastly. The rapidly evolving landscape means, of course, this also has to be on all the time. I can access it from anywhere. Don't tell me that I have to go to a certain spot <laughs> to get to it. I want to get to it anywhere. Um, and, and that creates a, a host of challenges as well. Mr. Neal. Thank you. Okay, so um, I want to tell you guys kind of where we were at in the past, but before I do that, I want to find out from you guys, and I want to kind of really pull you guys, what were you guys kind of seeing, and you can just shout it out once you think of them, what were you guys kind of seeing 15 years ago, give or take, circa Windows XP days? What are some of the security risks, some of the things that you guys were thinking of back then? I know we've got some younger people. But. <laughs> Viruses. <laughs> Viruses. How many machines were still running Windows 98? Yeah. 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 How about Windows ME? Who, who remembers Win Windows ME <laughs> and what a disaster that was? Um, Central Control of Antivirus. Central Control of Antivirus? Novell. Novell. Yeah, we did use Novell servers back then, that's true. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Definitely a, a, a big issue. Worms. Worms. Yeah. Kind of biggest security threats that we were kind of seeing in the past. Any others? Files Sorry, I've lost track of who's. Oh, there we are. Yeah. You're behind the camera. <laughs> uh, the kids renaming comp files to launch them before the login. Ah, good point. Good point, yes. So we all dealt with all these, uh, you know, a, a, a huge variety of issues that we felt these were the hottest things in security. These are the biggest vulnerabilities, the biggest security holes that we'll ever face are these viruses that are hitting our computers. What do we see now? What are you guys seeing today? Fishing. Fishing. Fishing, huge. I mean, in our district alone, I mean, we, we get hit by a phishing attack, right? We've had security training. We've had training for staff. But how many people do you think will still click on that email no matter how many times you, that they've received training? 98%. 98%? <laughs> <laughs> I think we do have a statistic, but um, what else? Student-initiated network stress tests. <laughs> okay, yes. That's called March Madness. <laughs> yeah, some old these Minecraft servers running on the network. Students yeah. using these to bypass every single thing. Okay, yeah. How many of your students use VPNs while they're connected to your guest network? About 80%. Well, they don't have a guest network. They'll just go onto their... They're 4G. Sure. Yeah. They don't even have to jump on our network, yeah. Yeah. right? They don't need us to get out on the internet. But how do we protect our assets? 
you know, what's out there? What are what are the things that we're facing now, and how are we addressing those things? Um, I want to talk really briefly about some CIS controls. Of course, I left them all the way over here. How many of you guys know what the CIS control doc is? Have ever seen it before, used it before, read it? Excellent. Not a lot of people. <laughs> okay. Um, if you're looking for a way to kind of gauge your network, is kind of where are we in the, the general landscape of security, this is a great doc to go through. There, uh, there are 20 controls that are user vetted as to what you should secure in what order on your network. Okay, and it is broken up by three different categories of what it feels like. Look, just do the basic things first, right? Things like secure your admin passwords, <laughs> right? Things that seem really basic, but I mean, a lot of us fail in that area, right? We just found a system yesterday. <laughs> I will share with you because this is a system I really would love to get rid of. We just found a system yesterday that did have the default password still set on it. This is a system that's been in place for 12 years. 12 years, still running the default password on the admin account, on the local admin account. <laughs> oh, I said 12 days. That's what I meant, not 12 years. Um, one, of, one of the basic controls I want to talk about, too, is, is, uh, is inventory. Under the basic category, inventory comes up. Hardware and software inventory. Why would hardware and software inventory be one of the very first controls someone should implement. How do you secure stuff you don't know you have? <coughs> How do you secure stuff you don't know you have? Right? Um, <coughs> vulnerability management, patch management. Are we doing that? And are we doing it 100% on all our devices on a regular basis? Hmm. Controlled use of admin privileges. Maintenance, monitoring, logging, and analysis. How many people have a logging server? Oh, you nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of us have logging servers because why? Because they're expensive, because it means big disks and lots and lots of disks to have in your system. Very hard system to maintain and very hard to get all of your stuff shuffled over to logging servers. Um, I, I'm totally impressed <coughs> you guys are running it, by the way. I was just kidding about the nerds. Um, but yeah, it's a really critical aspect that they feel is one of the first things. And again, why? Why would logging be so important that it appears on the top of the list. I haven't gotten to firewalls yet. Firewalls is way down the list from where I'm at, right? In fact, firewalls is number nine and number 13. Nine and 13 or a firewalls line. You need to know that it happened. You need to know that it happened. GRC. Yeah, how do, I, how do I mitigate this issue that's on my network if I have no logging, no data, no analysis? You can set, uh, say it again? Yes, baselines, absolutely. Yeah, where were we and where are we and where are we going? Excellent. Yep. So, uh, you know, one of the first questions that uh, we get at Adnetix, you know, as a systems integrator is, well, how do I know if my security posture is effective? And really it comes down to uh, three bullet points is, you know, it's not a, it's not a if it's going to happen, it's a when the, the threat wins and, and, and it gets in, you know, when is the time to detect a uh, target that you guys are hoping to hit and, and how do you mitigate that once that threat comes in. So it's really having, having visibility of threats and having game plans to detect that and then respond to it. So it's really about shrinking this. Now, industry average is finding threats can take 200 days on, on an industry average. Sounds like a lot of time to be pivoting around in your network and looking for exposed systems, looking at that 12 day, right? Uh, yeah, uh, admin, admin password um, to try and gain more and more access. Um, you know, a lot of the threats that we see today aren't a grab and smash type of deal. They, they'll sit in your network and just do some reconnaissance for, for a while. Um, they'll they'll kind of linger for, for a good period of time and then uh, they find something valuable and then they take, take it out. 
Um, so it's really about shrinking that time to detect and, and respond to it. So that's, that's really the first goal is to um, come up, you know, use the CIS controls and, and, and uh, practices like CIS to, to start with that journey towards an effective security posture and reduce that time to respond once that threat does uh, attack your network. Again, you know, the, uh, there's a, a lot of questions for, from a systems integration standpoint. So where do I begin? Now, the first one, stopping threats at the edge. We're all pretty good at that now. We've been doing that for many, many years. So, I mean, this is, we're talking about your firewall here. Um, everybody's got a firewall, million different flavors of them. Um, but that's where, really where you, where you start. So basic level, protect from the, outs, from the outside. You can, you can uh, prevent quite a few things just by having a strong baseline on the outside. Next is protecting your users and wherever they might be. Um, so if, if you have your students working at home, like I said earlier, <coughs> are they protected then? I mean, a home network, uh, those can be kind of scary things sometimes. Um, and then, you know, if they, if they get infected at the home, you know, what are they bringing back into the network? Um, so protecting users wherever they might be. Um, thirdly, uh, simplified segmentation and access control. Uh, most of us do distributed routing. We have our VLAN set up for our different systems, like our... HVAC systems or sur surveillance systems, our voice system. Um, but uh, how many of you use like uh, Wired 802.1x on your network at this point? A few? Okay. Um, other other uh, access control uh, mechanisms uh, such as access control lists? Um, that's, that's even sometimes, uh, it's a balance between uh, you know, usability and, and security. So utilize the existing infrastructure that you have. I mean, we're talking your switches and routers here um, to simplify that spread of the threat. Um, so is your system vulnerable across the board if it lands on your voice VLAN or if it lands on a management VLAN somehow? Um, yes or no? I mean, that, those are good questions to ask. And then lastly, again, it's not an if, it's a win. And uh, when those threats get in, do you have solutions in place to help you find and contain those and not lose a, a lot of downtime from a perspective of operationally? You know, it's, it's a lot of work to reimage machines. Who likes doing that? Uh, it's a lot of work to find issues at times. Um, so having game plans around once the threats get into the network and ha are, are starting to pivot around and make make moves in your, in your network, uh, finding and containing those those issues. And specifically, what does that journey look like for Salem Kaiser? Well, this was our disaster. This was actually we submitted this to yeah. Dilbert. So. <laughs> we um, so again, I want to throw it out to you guys. Where were you guys? just five to 10 years ago. So we kind of talked about 15 years ago. Where were you guys five to 10 years ago in your organization? And kind of what, what were you guys doing back then that you've been able to correct now? Change management. Change management. Okay, that's a good one. Any others? I'll share some of the, what, the ones that we've done. 50% inventoried. And when I threw this out, I threw this out to some friends at technology and they said, hey, I think you added a zero to that number. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, generously 50% inventoried. Okay, again, why is that important? Because you don't know, if you don't know what you have, you don't know what to secure, right? Really critical one. Little patch management, okay, we had some patching going on, but there was a time when we were basically told, hey, if this is a change that can be seen or felt or interrupts a customer at any time for any reason, we can't do it. Okay? And 
I, I hope that you guys are able to work through some administrative issues because I know, I mean, we're a school district. We run into that, that issue. I mean, and, and I hope that you guys have been able to work through some of those issues, but that are, that, those are some of the issues that are out there. I've seen them at several different school districts where it's just like, well, I know you guys are saying patch management's great. I know patching the server sounds great, but you're gonna have to reboot it and we just can't let you reboot it. So, and that's kind of where we were. Um, but same thing on desktops. It wasn't just, just an administrative issue. It was something uh, uh, systemic across the organization because that kind of filtered down to, well, if we don't really need to patch our servers. I mean, <laughs> our desktops, do we really need to be patching those every week? I mean, maybe we can get by with like every six months. It would be pretty cool, maybe. Right? How many of you guys use privileged accounts? Okay, a couple. Everybody uses accounts. The best. How, how many people <laughs> should be using privileged accounts? <laughs> right? <laughs> how are you managing without privileged accounts? I know, I know. You have one, one account and you can add yourself to domain admins and you're good to go, right? It's the um, old school way. That, that is the old school way. Actually, that is totally true. <laughs> that is the old school way. But something that we were traditionally doing is we'd add ourselves to domain admins. Right, and that was easy. It was simple. Maybe we'd remove ourselves from enterprise admins because we think that that's going to protect us a little better. Or maybe even schema admins, we're not going to add ourselves to that because hey, that that sounds dangerous. But in actuality, what's your most dangerous group in Active Directory? Yeah. Domain admins, right? <laughs> because why? Keys to the yeah, the the keys to everything. Because domain, if you remember domain admins, you can add yourself to any group you want, right? <laughs> so that's that's there's your most dangerous group out there. Um, yeah, didn't have privileged accounts in our district. We were using a traditional firewall at the time, a, a Cisco ASA is what we were using at the time. Not that it's bad, but we weren't doing the more that we could have been doing. Uh, few logs that we were doing before. Uh, we had no idea what the state of our malware was. Uh, in some cases, we had, we had some malware software that was running and was, we were getting reports from it, but then we'd get malware on the computers that were getting reported from other software that we'd install on there. So an unknown state of where we were malware-wise. No lapse. Who knows, who knows what lapse is? Who can define lapse briefly? What it is and what it does. Local admin passwords. Oh, yeah. There we go. Local admin password sync. Okay. Use it. We weren't. Um, we didn't have a spam filter. Can you guys believe that? Five to ten years. <laughs> Within five to ten years, we didn't have a proper spam filter in place. Okay. Any more you guys want to throw out? Local admin everywhere. Local admin everywhere. How many people still have that? Local admin everywhere. Well. You know, for students. for security guys, it's it's so hard because you, you just want to go. Oh, we just want to pull that back. But what kind of resistance do you get in the schools? The only place we have to have it still is AutoCAD. Still forces local admin for the use of... Did you guys hear that? AutoCAD. AutoCAD still forces that. And Enforces the local admin. Any others? Teachers sharing their credentials in the class. No. Yes. No. Yes. They never oh my God. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we'd have an issue where... It's a rumor I heard. It <laughs> Um, one of our one of our techs had walked into a building one time, and right there on the whiteboard was the password to the Wi-Fi. Right. Great and, book. Great book. And at the time, there was no difference between the student and staff Wi-Fi, but there was a perception that well, since there's a different Wi-Fi, I must get you know more internet if I connect to that. And so, I don't I don't know I don't know why they felt that way, but that's it is what it is. Okay. Where are we now? I'll be honest with you, this was the hardest slide to come up with of all the slides. And it's because I think it's hard to admit where you are and where your faults currently are. And I think it, maybe it's a human nature thing that we don't want to admit where we are. I'd say we're about 90% inventoried in our district. Now, will we ever get 100% inventoried? Yes. <laughs> All right. My boss is in the room. Yes, we will. We will get 100. percent Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Um, vulnerability management. Okay. 
We're controlling our admin privileges. We're doing some logging, but not as much logging as we would like to be doing. There's an area that we're kind of failing on that we need to true up and do more of. We're now using next generation firewall, which does give us some of that next generation. In the, in the firewall stack, you know, you have, you have layers, layers three and four, typically where your general firewall lays, and then, uh, you know, a next gen firewall is all the way to the application layer where you can inspect, you know, your bit tor, tor traffic, that kind of thing. So we're now got a next generation firewall that kind of help us protect against some of those things, and we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, we have a basic security awareness and training program in the district. Uh, we have an incident response team. So it was previously when, when, a, when a, a spam email would come in, that was it. I mean, we, we didn't even know <laughs> which accounts were getting that spam email. Now we have a system to where those spam messages, uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying spam messages, I'm meaning phishing messages. As the phishing messages come in, there's a team that will respond to those incidents and help mitigate that issue with the customer. Um, we're doing also some account monitoring, particularly with our, our admin privileged accounts. So anywhere they log in, it will email us a report of, hey, your account logged in these places, and we'll review those places to make sure that those are the places we actually did log into. Okay, where are we going? See, Bob, 100% inventory. <laughs> um, fully animated, implemented CIS controls, these are great. These are absolutely fantastic controls. If you don't have a framework for where you feel you should go and how you should get there, this is a great framework to base off of. There's more than just this. There's more than just CIS controls. This is free to download, free to get. It's community driven. They're excellent topics. It's not even very long. I mean, it's like, it's like 80 pages or something like that. It's a pretty easy read. Really cool stuff in here. And they organize it in a way where uh, where for your controls, each one has a little sub control. So this is hardware assets, and then below it, you've got like little sub categories that. So in hardware assets, you can accomplish this, then this, then this, then this. Just kind of break it down to those little bite-sized pieces that you can actually do, rather than just give you well, just hardware inventory everything. You know that's number one, right? So it gives you a little little framework to go by. Um, continuous monitoring, maintenance, regular penetration tests. Um, Expanded security awareness and training program. We're going to work on tightening our boundary defense and proactively looking for ways to improve our security. Um, are we ever going to be, I'm throwing this out there, are you ever going to be 100% no. secure? Ever? No. Why? Like, because everything's users. users. Wait, somebody. You have users. You have users. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have everything. Because we still have people, right? Yeah, everything. It, 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 and 100% security does not necessarily go with the district's goals. Okay. Good I mean, point. You, you have risks that they're willing to accept. So, you know, if you're talking about an accepted or mitigated risk, if you're saying you get to that level and you're now at 100%, that's fine. But, you know, the, the old joke is we can make it secure by unplugging all the switches. Mm -hmm. so that's not going to do anything. Right? Yeah. UCISSP about people out there will know that it's, it's an ongoing process. Right? This is something that you do have to accept some risks as being, look, this is just, yeah, we can plug this hole, but to do it, we're going to have to barricade each person from each other, and then we're going to have to have these steel doors to go in and out of, and then we have to body scan everybody, and it's just not going to happen. How difficult would it be to maintain something like that with less and less resources, and also budget, money-wise? Um, looking at your uh, regular penetration testing, um, I mean, at what it's a good question. Anybody have an answer? So regular penetration testing doesn't necessarily need to be done by a third party. You can have devices on the inside that are going out and looking at vulnerabilities, and then you can do an AWS that's going in from the outside. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to engage third parties unless you want, you know, you have regulations where you have to do that or auditors that require that once a year. Mm -hmm. But regular penetration testing does not necessarily need to be something you constantly pay for. You can do something yourself. Don't forget that yeah. your students are already doing it for you. Yep. You just have to figure out how to get them on your side. Yes. Yeah. Figure figure out the one that's in the principal's office the most <laughs> and then offer them an internship. Yeah. <laughs> and a quick question for you guys. Uh, how many of you have done a pen test knowing that you were going to fail? Well, 
yeah. anybody I mean, who's done right? a pen test knows right? they're going to fail. I mean, <laughs> but you no, know, already having the baseline, you know, you already know we're going to fail this, this, and this, this. So you can be you can be choosy about when you do that. You know, if you start to implement some of these controls and you think you have a, a better idea, a better baseline, maybe then is the pen test uh, versus, you know, uh, we, we want to check a box on the pen test. Because what number is pen test on the CIS? Number 20. Yeah, the very last one. one. Yeah. So, um, but often, often it becomes the first one. Why would you want to do it first, though? I think I heard priorities, it right here. red uh, baseline. You want a baseline, right? Yeah. I want to know where I came from. I know I'm going to fail. I know I'm going to fail this penetration test, but I want to know where we started, so I know where we ended. That's why a lot of people will start with a penetration test, so they know where did we go after all this. I know we're going to fail. Um, but they do recommend a penetration test after you've done all this, okay? You don't know what you don't know, right? I'm aware of certain systems that I'm aware of, but maybe there's a backdoor vulnerability to WordPress that I wasn't aware of that I have an opening in the firewall to be able to get to. I wasn't aware of it. I don't know anything about it, and therefore I allowed it, right? But and a penetration test might be a good opportunity to be able to find those. And holes. unfortunately, sometimes leadership that has the money might tend to believe a security company external more than what you're saying. Good point. Sometimes can just back up, yes, what I've been saying has been the truth all along, and it just kind of gives you more ammunition from a neutral third party. Good point. All right. <laughs> so. I don't I think uh, Penny's actually binge watching something. It's not, it's not actually related to <laughs> problems with her computer. But uh, <laughs> the the part that I wanted to to show here is um, you know just inevitably we're, we're all targets. Um, K twelve cybersecure is uh, from EdTech. Um, they 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 kind of track the public um, publicly aware. Uh, vulnerabilities and uh, stuff that's hit the news and things like that. Uh, I see some dots in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, not calling anybody out, but uh, just it's just a, an awareness of you know over 120 at least advertised um, events, threats that that got into the network and and at least made the papers. And that's something that we all can agree on that we want to avoid uh, in our district. Um, that was in 2018, and uh, I think they've started tracking in 2015 um, in terms of publicized of events, uh, and it's over 400. So I, a lot more unadvertised events than that, for sure. Uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting read. Uh, there's some good resources on there as well, and it's, it's good to get a sense of what, what else is going on in the community and um, what they're getting hit with. Um, but... Really, I, I wanted to uh, you know, highlight the, the fact that it, it, it's a great idea to, to know uh, that there are limitations in terms of time, personnel, you know, lack of expertise uh, on teams. Often we're very, we're very strapped for, for time and, and uh, training to, to actually be able to handle some of these threats in, in our network. Um, so. Lean on partnerships of others. Um, you know, utilize uh, systems integrators and manufacturers that can help you on that journey to get you to a better place within your network. Um, over a million jobs in 2018 uh, related to security went unfulfilled. So that tells you how much of this is needed and it's, it's just not there due to a lack of training. Good ideas to get those students that are your pen testers <laughs> on your team. Like, I, I thought the internship idea is a great, great idea. Um, they can they can be a good resource for you as well. Um, and and lastly, just you know, build a, a community around you. Uh, I recommend getting on as many email lists and list serves mm -hmm. and Webex Teams rooms or Slack rooms. Anything where you can share information. Hey, are you seeing this? Is this phishing scam hitting you guys? You know, any of those will be a, a great resource for you. Um, Fred, I don't know, do you have any uh, other input on that? The build a community doesn't necessarily need to be a for free activity. Mm -hmm. Community is what you're participating in here is a good starting point of, of a community. And to your, to your point, 
take your radius out from just yourself. Don't don't try and do this by yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, so, lastly, we kind of want to end it, want to end on uh, Neil showing some of the the ways that firepower threat defense has helped Salem Kaiser. So we're going to try a live demo. <laughs> and you guys know how these go. <laughs> Notice I volunteered Neil. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, make sure it's still connected here. <laughs> That's kind of squiggly on that side. How many of you guys have seen the Firepower software before? You've used it? Um, it's pretty good software. Uh, I've been you know, pretty happy with it. Uh, we haven't used it all that long. We've been using it about uh, four or five months, something like that. Um, but it's been, so far, a, a great piece of software for us. It's really helped us to to, to really understand what's on our network, what's happening on our network, what things are going on. Uh, a traditional firewall will only kind of tell you what IP addresses are doing what, but doesn't really go into the, the nitty gritty of which applications are doing it, what websites are going to. Um, so let me just show you at first the dashboard and kind of what this looks like. Uh, I, add a, I added the, I added the uh, traffic rate um, widget over there. You can add your own widgets to the dashboard and customize it however you want. Uh, how many people can convert that off the top of their head? Kilobytes to gigabits? Yeah. What about machines? Yeah. <laughs> uh, probably about 800 to 900 megabits, I'm going to guess, just by looking at the number, <laughs> um, is kind of what we're pushing right now in our district. This is a live demo of what's actively happening. What's actually happening on the network, though? Let me show you some of the applications it's detecting on the network. Can you guys read what the first one is? I'm sorry to some of you guys in the back that, that can't read what this says. How many of you are surprised that YouTube is the number one? I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, th these are common things that we normally see. I mean, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. I mean, like all the top categories here. You know, I wonder if I try to blow this up a little bit. This is always, yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know if I dare try to do this. There you go. Can you guys read that a little better? Um, yeah, not not too surprising what's happening on our network, but this at least gives us a pane of glass that we can see what's happening on our network. And not only can we see what's happening on our network, we can do something about what's happening on our network. So um, let me go through some of the things that I thought were most interesting uh, about the firepower. And then we can go through, uh, kind of ask you guys what you guys want to see, what you guys know about the firepower product, what it can do, or even next gen firewalls in general, what they can do. A lot of them will do similar things to each other. Um, let me start by showing you guys no, I don't want to start here. Sorry. Let me start in access control. So on a firepower device, everything's controlled by a single policy, in a sense. The access control policy <laughs> is the policy that ultimately gets targeted to your firewall, to your firewalls. So in a firepower setup, you uh, at least on the 4120s, uh, Fred, you can chime in on the other <laughs> firepowers. <laughs> on our 4120s, what we've got is we've got a 4120 firewall, a second 40, 4120 firewall, and then we've got a fire power management center that runs on a, uh, more or less a UCS chassis uh, running the software that you're seeing here. And so all their policies and stuff are written in the software and then when you hit the deploy button, it goes and configures the firewall for you. So on the firewall itself, not really much to do other than give it an IP address, give it a DNS, you know, all that good stuff. All right, let's edit our ACPE policy here. This is a live demo. Uh, so by default, what this policy is doing is just inspecting traffic as it comes in. That's all it does. So I want to add a rule and do something a little more. So I'm going to say, uh, let's pick on something fun. 
Let's say I want to block an application. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. you can block it. You can block it. <laughs> Let's say I want to block BitTorrent sites. Okay? Done. Okay. Um, that's all there is. I wish I had more to show you on that one. But it actually is really easy to configure, uh, really simple, not much to it. You just add, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't add the zone suit. I just said for everything, but that's okay in this case. Um, this will now block BitTorrent traffic, right? But let's say I want to get a little more granular because maybe I don't just want to block BitTorrent traffic. Maybe what I really want to do is block <coughs> BitTorrent traffic that's sourcing from China. <coughs> okay. So some geolocation filters as well as application layer filters. So this is going all the way to the application stack for your application layer filters. Uh, I, a lot of IP address filters in the geolocation, but a geolocation database that's constantly updated by Cisco. Um, downloaded the firewall. And actually, to Neil's point, the update is coming that the choice the, the administrator of the firewall can choose how often they want that update to come to them. But the source of that is out of our Talos research environment, which actually, if you look at the size of the research pool that we have, which is over 300 security researchers, we are the largest research in entity outside of the three-letter acronym <laughs> environments in the government. Okay. Um. If you're looking for a podcast on the way home, I suggest Beers with Talos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they do monthly, uh, but they have really interesting stories about security events that they see all over the world. Um, they've helped a lot of countries out of sticky situations, and they have uh, interesting stories to tell. So if you're interested in that, uh, listening to some of that, I, I do suggest that podcast if you're a podcast listener. Um, let's say instead of... Or actually, let's say just on top of BitTorrent traffic, I want to categorize things that are considered very high risk and very low business relevance. Things like your, can you guys read these? <laughs> is there a reason? Categorizing correctly is your opinion. <laughs> yeah. Is there a reason students should be, should be going to these places, right? So maybe I add that to the rule. And now it's blocking not only BitTorrent traffic, but also that very high risk, very low business relevance. And applications, and you can build these own application filters. You can build your own application filters to do whatever you want. Um, uh, I've gone through and built a couple of them. Uh, they're really easy to set up uh, and and filter down to whatever applications that you want for your organization. Uh, if you want Adult Friend Finder on there for your campus for whatever reason, <laughs> I guess you can filter that out and create your own rule. Um, but the nice thing about this is, so on a on the traditional firewall, at least on the ASA, how you'd have to you know, build, we'd end up ultimately building multiple rules to do the same thing. You know, we'd end up building, uh, we're, I can't remember who I was chatting about now, and I apologize, but the, our, our old firewall, when I first inherited it, had about 500 firewall rules in it, right? Kind of redid it, <laughs> reorganized it. We went down from 500 to about 100 firewall rules. Now we're talking about traditional rules, right? We're at about, I think, 30 rules now in the firepower because we're able to consolidate even more a lot of these rules down because ultimately we're doing the same thing. We want to allow the same ports or disallow the same ports as we were before. We just want to go and add, you know, I want all these ports from this server to this server. And we can now do it in just one single rule. Is there a question? Can you share uh, some high level kind of uh, things that you're doing with the SSL decryption policies with us? That's a great, that's a great question. Come see me after because that is a huge topic. <laughs> so, yeah, setting up SSL decryption, it is, it is totally, cap totally capable of doing SSL decryption. Uh, I'm blocking things like BitTorrent in here. Will this block all BitTorrent? That's a question for you guys. Will this block all BitTorrent? Why not? Every port of management. It's more than just the port. It's encryption, right? So the, the standard as it was written, I'm going to throw a number out there, 2003, 2004 for BitTorrent traffic. 
right, was you would unencrypt the handshake that happens between device and client. So when they go, hey, I want this file, you can capture that torrent file as the handshake happens, right? You'd be shocked the number of BitTorrent clients that are still out there still using the traditional unencrypted handshake. But there's a reason why a lot of them don't use an encrypted handshake. It's available now. They have it out there. A lot of people don't use it because it limits the number of uh, servers and other people that you can connect to when you go download stuff. And don't ask me how I know all this. And to Neil's point, this is definitely a after the session conversation because there are, there are technologies that we have released to the market that actually allow us to do encrypted traffic analytics without breaking the privacy policy, without carrying the packet. Yeah, I do have SSL decryption on here. And I'm sorry, it's just, it's a huge topic, but yeah, we could definitely go into that. But it's gonna it's gonna take a half hour to go through SSL decryption easily by itself. So, <laughs> um, let's talk about some security intelligence feeds. How many of you guys have ever used Fish Tank before? How many of you guys know what Fish Tank is? It's a moldy oldie. It's a list of um, phishing sites that are pulled by FishTank.com. A list of known bad guys, basically, that are sending phishing attacks. You can pull that security intelligence feed right into the Firepower. So here's some, this is actively happening. This happened 11 minutes ago. We saw a bad guy coming in, right? In some cases, we're monitoring because we don't actually trust these rules as they come in. We don't actually block everything coming from just uh, fishtank.com. We want to inspect first and know what that is and make sure, validate that that really is what they say it is. And in other cases, we are blocking, not because we're blocking, but because Cisco's already blocking it. Cisco's already categorized those as known bad guys. And so there's a lot of them that'll be in this list that'll already be blocked by default. Uh, but other ones that are definitely worth taking a look at. Uh, you can import these sources. Uh, if you, I guess, ever use taxi feeds, that's okay. Um, you can pull in these lists right into the firewall from third-party vendors and get real-time statistics of incidents that are happening on your firewall. I think that's important to highlight is that you know, next-gen firewalls, a big piece of it is bringing in other third parties and other resources because like we were saying, this is a community that we have to build ourselves around. We're not going to win every time, uh, but when we do the best that we can, pulling in different de data sources and sharing some of that telemetry to make uh, good decisions on your firewall. Um, so the more sources, the better yeah, in, in a lot of ways. And one of the things, to, to Neil's point, Neil may have a different set of lists that he wants to pull into his system than Mark Mark wants to or than anyone else <coughs> wants to. So you get to make this, this the pull set that is un unique that you trust. If you have a, a trust of a given feed, bring it in. You can do URL filtering right through it as well. Uh, utilizes Umbrella. You get, how, do you, how many of you guys know where Umbrella came from? OpenDNS. OpenDNS, yes. Used to be OpenDNS, or still is OpenDNS, I guess. OpenDNS is a, a resident evil. No, not resident evil. <laughs> individual use. Umbrella is the commercial service. There you go. Uh, there are some lists from the product, though, that they will allow you to. Uh, we, we don't subscribe to the, the Umbrella service currently. But there are some, let's say, categories of URLs that Cisco feels is important enough that everybody should just get the lists. Um, let me show you what those look like real quick. And this actually comes back to if you're looking, if you were in the last session and all of the things that were being attacked from a DNS perspective, um, DNS is a low hanging fruit for security attackers these days. And if you're not doing something to protect, your DNS, whether it's on-prem or through a cloud service that actually lets that protection follow your student with them, um, you definitely want to look at that as one of your one of your protections to add into your portfolio. So we we have the threat defense software, and I, I, I had to kind of shrink this because I couldn't really scroll very well. Um, right here on the left-hand side, these are all lists that are updated by Cisco. So uh, DGAs, crypto mining, uh, command and control, bots, attackers. These are all lists that are constantly updated by Cisco. Um, and we can just take these lists, uh, import them right into our rules.
tools uh, to to block. So add to blacklist done. So now all those URL categories are now filtered out. There's also a series of networks that are kind of in the same boat. There's a series of networks. These again, uh, phishing, spam, suspicious networks, that kind of thing. Just lists of IP addresses basically um, that are categorized by Talos. Tal Talos does the analysis on this and essentially think of this as <coughs> whether it's a good neighborhood or a bad neighborhood. And there are there are ways to bring it in as an automated feed. There are ways for you to add it in as an exception as well. So if there are, you have controls of if something is categorized in that general neighborhood and you want to specifically set it as an exemption, that's in, under your control as well. Um, DNS policies, uh, they're, they're in the same boat. There's a list of, of uh, DNS policies. You can kind of see them here. We've already added them in. Uh, you can sinkhole those if you want to, you know, add it to a, add it to a server. Uh, one of the things with DNS that you'll find in malware is uh, sometimes the malware is looking for it not to respond to a <coughs> DNS query. So sometimes you might want to sinkhole that data instead, which is send it to a dummy server. So it gets a response, but it's the wrong response. But at least it's getting a response. And you might do that so you can further analyze, maybe send that over to a honeypot, so you can further, further analyze that traffic and what it's doing. So another thing that's kind of just built into the box. Um, lastly, I kind of want to go over to the reports and analysis, just kind of just kind of get a flavor for for kind of what's in here, what it can do, what kind of things it's finding uh, for us. Oh, sorry, there's one more thing that I didn't touch on, and that was the the snort rules. I'm going to, I'm going to touch on that just very 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 briefly. So uh, so snort rules are built in. The whole snort engine is built into. You know, you used to have have an IDS IPS built in. Now it's just built into the firewall, so it does IDS IPS inspection uh, all at once. The, some of, the, some of the, the cool things that we've found with this is it will uh, scan your network for what's actually active on the network. So you're not importing every single rule, every single snort rule that's out there. If any of you guys have used snort for any point, at, at any point in time, you'll know it's, it's intense. It is an intense inspection, right? And you don't want to be scanning every single rule that possibly exists in the snort engine because you're going to be sitting there for days for your packet to pass through the firewall, right? So you don't want that. So, so what it does instead is it tries to get a baseline or a lay of the land of what is on your network. Do you have Macs? Do you have PCs? What version are they at? So you do a scan of your network. It tries to figure out, okay, what are the kind of things and what's the patch level it's at? And then it's got a series of, of connectivity policies where you, you I, I'm not going to point, point across the screen here, but the firepower recommendations. You can have that set on a periodic basis where it just goes, for us, it's every week. It resets the firepower recommendations where it goes, okay, I did another port scan. I now know what's better know what's on your network. And I just found there's a, there's a new version of WordPress that you're running on your network. And there's these vulnerabilities we can now scan for. And it will tag those and add those to the list of things it's now scanning for on the network, all automatically. So you're not constantly having to come in here, futz with it, change things, add things, remove things. And this, this goes to um, your question earlier, how do you do this with less resources less human resources. You automate it as much as possible. You use the feed. You let our teams do the analysis, and you're in a monitor mode, not in a create mode. You can create your own rules in here if you want to go to that level. Um, uh, I mean, if you've ever created a rule, it's, it's cumbersome. It is. But uh, if you have a very specific need or a very specific vulnerability that you're trying to patch for and you need it done right now, great way to kind of get in, create your own rule for that. Um, all right, let's go back over to the dashboard real quick. I think we'll kind of end with this. Okay. So some of our threats that we're finding right now on our network, right? One of our DNS servers is popping up. Why would a DNS server pop up? on a list of threats. I tell you, most of the ones that I, that I look at on here, it's because there's somebody on your network that's done a DNS query for something bad, and the DNS server is doing that query for them, and then Firepower <laughs> flags the DNS server saying, hey, this DNS server just tried to be out of the internet. OK, just going to niche, niche cases there. Uh, kind of a way that you can see kind of what's going on in the network. The scale here is really mucking with the numbers, but let me see if I can back this out a little. There, that's a little better. 
Um, on this right hand side, you can kind of see the number of incidents that it's categorized. So 14 Tor exit nodes. What's a Tor exit node? What's the Tor network? Dark web, right? Bad stuff. You don't want me muck in there, right? Yet there's 14 instances of Tor exit nodes that it's being able to detect, 526 attackers. And a lot of these attacks will be correlated to actual events. So what we found in here is, going back to the snort rules again, uh, the snort rules that are enabled, you, you know, just because there's a vulnerability on Windows 10 doesn't mean I'm vulnerable to it, depending on the version of Windows 10 that I'm running, right? So just because there's an attacker that comes in and hits my box, and there's a vulnerability that could potentially be on my box, because it knows my box is at a later version, and this vulnerability is capable of, of compromising, it will filter that out of the results. So I get more true results and less false positives that have to chase down. So anyway, Derek? Uh, a couple questions just to came to you. So when you get alerts, um, how does your team handle uh, such alerts if there are events that you want to take a further look at? Yeah, so they call Neil and they say, hey, Neil, go take care of this. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it definitely something to add to the incident response team, like, certainly. Area for improvement. Anyone else have any questions? Anything that, yeah? Are you guys running SCCM in your environment? Yes. Okay. And some of like the patching aspect, is that what you're using for your patch manager? Yes, we are using SCCM for patch manager. What are you using for antivirus? Uh, we are using Microsoft's Windows Defender for, for antivirus. So this yeah. is kind of um, overlapping to an extent? There, there is a malware engine that's built into this that you can get, uh, and and there's an agent for that that will live uh, uh, local to your box. Um, Fred, maybe you can talk a little more to the malware piece. We don't use the malware uh, uh, engine, the malware piece of this, uh, the, the, that, that the client that actually lives on the desktop. Yeah, so you, you've got um, client, uh, essentially think of it as places in the network that you could protect. So when you're looking at it from a client perspective, there's nothing wrong with using Microsoft's tool if that's the most convenient, the most economical for you at the endpoint. Running a different engine that's at a different pinch point in your environment will show different results. So it, again, it goes back to primary defense in depth. Don't use the same engine because the same engine will always give you the same results. If you use different engines analyzing the, the information, you should get different results out of that, and it's a better protection model. Think of it as multiple layers of cheesecloth for things for a filtration system. Yeah. So how did you guys go from 50% to 90% and 90% to 100%? Well, we haven't gone to, we haven't got from gone from 90 to 100%, but a lot of it is a lot of it is administration. So uh, we did have an administration turnover, and it was just a big push. Uh, so so it, when you have a lot of push from 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 the top, it really helps when you have boots on the ground that are actually doing the work or, or want to do the work to actually get that done. You know, when, when, you, have, when you have the drive, and I'm, I'm talking even all the way from the board level. You know, sometimes it's at that point where the superintendent's just like, look, I would love to let you guys do this, but the board's telling me we can't. You know, they're, they're telling me we don't have the money to do this or whatever the case is, right? That kind of thing can happen. Luckily in Salem Pizer, we have great support from the superintendent, from, from Bob, from administration. Uh, to help us really get stuff done. So that's that's made a big change, a big impact in our environment. Tool-wise, what do you guys use? Uh, for, for hardware software inventory. Uh, hardware software inventory. SharePoint. SharePoint. Have you taken any of this data and publicized it to any of your that's a that's a good question. We're we're not currently publicizing this um, that I'm aware of. Uh, I mean, maybe some of the data is make it in some way uh, to higher levels. I, I I don't know. Not anything formally. Are you guys using the logging data in any, any ways beyond just real time with firepower? Uh, not yet. We've been using this product about four months now, so we're still kind of in the in the let's create this policy test it phase see what it does see what it logs see what it you know see what we get back from it so we are still in a you know let's let's tune this you know try to tune out as many of the false positives as, as we possibly can so that the logs are more useful to us so is this a log server uh there there is a log that's kept 
uh, on this server, but you are you're actually expected to, to offload the logs onto something else if you want to keep something long term. If, if, you, if you want it for a retention purpose, you're gonna you're gonna offload it all. Do you guys use a Seam server? N no, we don't use a Seam server. Yeah. Do you guys use a Seam server in your environment? You're looking at it. Yeah. So, same with us. We're we're looking at it. it they're expensive. <laughs> Netix would love to sell you a Seam server. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's the log and log rotate to archive it off. That's probably that's where we're going to start. I think uh, some of the education service districts are doing that a lot. Yeah, there's definitely a walk, walk, crawl, walk around this model. Yeah. The sophistication of log management. Any other questions? Did you say the implementation of this general <laughs> has reduced the amount of effort you spend trying to achieve the knowledge and things that this has done? Or has the work stayed the same, but now you're just able to do more? Uh, I, I think to your second point, kind of the, you know, the, the work kind of stays the same, but you're able to do more with the same amount of effort. You know, or, or in some ways, I mean, we, we run two firewalls in, in our environment, and we have the, the second firewall only in a testing phase right now. But I have noticed just having the two firewalls, it is easier to kind of deploy to both firewalls at the same time. So you're not having to configure one, log off, configure the other, you know, and, and do the whole, I've got to now check to make sure that they're, they're identical kind of stuff. I mean, it's all handled in the software for you. So. Good question. Yeah, I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So this is a Cisco product. Yes, correct? Okay. And so with that and the ACLs and the traffic filtering detection, does this integrate into the further Cisco stack across horizontally in the networks? So east west so like if it detects traffic coming from something, coming out and say, hey, you know what, I think this machine, there's something wrong, there's something on it. I'm just going to put it in a separate VLAN and modify that on that switch so that it can't affect it anymore. With the prop with the proper level of switching switching infrastructure and routing infrastructure? Also. Yes, this this can this this will integrate with ICE if you're using that product, and you can build you can put your ICE rules right in here to be able to block. Yeah. So when when you're when you're looking at it from um, an integration of this intelligence being leveraged as part of your as part of your portfolio, yes, it is a horizontal. So I, I was going to show you that it would take too much time. Um, yeah. It, if, if you are implementing ICE, you can pull uh, individual devices and say, hey, look, I want this policy to apply just to MacBook Air, so, you know, if, if you really want to uh, get, get to that granular level. Um, any other questions? We're going to wrap. We're in the red dot four. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Said something about jumping jacks. Yeah, yeah we got to <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>